I've had the privilege of studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999. Uh, these were the organizations that had the best project due date performance and development. They had the best operational stability, reliability, and performance in operations. Uh, these were the organizations that had the best security and the best posture compliance. And so our mission was to study these organizations to figure out how did they make their good to great transformation so that the rest of us could replicate their journey. Uh, you know, there were many surprises on that journey, and perhaps the biggest one is that it led me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important because it is a solution to what I believe is the largest business problem of our generation, the likes of which we have not seen in 30 years when manufacturing was transformed by the lean principles. So in the next 44 minutes, what I would like to do as your self-appointed ambassador from the DevOps community is share with you two things. Why I think DevOps is so important, and two is more importantly, maybe the how of DevOps. How are organizations uh, doing tens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, stability, security, and performance? Something that we didn't even think possible five years ago. So why do I think DevOps is so important? It's because about seven years ago, we found that there was a downward spiral that was happening in every organization, independent of company size, independent of industry vertical, profit, not-for-profit, there was a corrosive, destructive downward spiral happening that affected development, test, operations, and ultimately the organizations that we serve. So what I want to share with you is why that, uh, what that downward spiral looks like. And it happens because of, I think, technical debt. So uh, technical debt is what Ward Cunningham phrased 15 years ago in the development community. He said, technical debt is what we feel the next time we try to make a change. So every time that we deploy code into the production environment without testing, without telemetry, uh, you know, every time that we cut the non-functional requirements, such as performance, security, deployment, manageability, reliability, all those non-functional requirements that we need in order for the service to run predictably in production and actually operate as designed. And I think, uh, by the way, one of my favorite quotes uh, is, you know, legacy code. You know, uh, Michael Feathers, his definition of legacy code is any code that doesn't have an automated test, right? So think about how many times are we actually generating legacy code and as a part of our daily work. So technical debt, I think, is a, a beautiful phrase, almost poetic, right? Because when I visualize technical debt, I view it like this. It is the accumulation of all the crap in the data center that accrues over decades, each time made with a promise that we're going to fix, fix it when we have a little bit more time. And of course, there's never enough time, uh, now more than ever. And so this, although bad, is not as bad as this. Right? So imagine how bad this is for availability, right? Suppose that you have a mission critical service uh, and it goes down and you even know because you have incredible telemetry and you have incredible uh, configuration management practices that it's due to a cabling error and you even know it's due to a cabling error between the SAN and the database, the question becomes, which cable is it? And the answer, of course, is this one, right? But be careful not to touch the wrong cable because somewhere in that rack there's a loose cable. Then if you touch it, the entire site goes down, right, like last week, but we'll fix it when we have a little bit more time. So that is one downward spiral. At the conclusion of almost every software project, we have one more fragile artifact in production. But there's actually a more insidious, far more destructive downward spiral that happens, which is that deployments start taking longer. In other words, so think of a friend who's been associated with an application that used to take five minutes to deploy, so it's taking 10 minutes, so it's taking an hour, so it's taking a day, so it's taking two days, so it's taking a week. I've had firsthand experience with a $6 billion a year revenue generating service uh, in the display ad serving business uh, that took six weeks to deploy. It took 300 people spanning dev, test, and operations to actually deploy this thing. You know, it involved something like an estimated 1,300 manual error prone steps. And so when this happens, this starts planting the seeds between the intertribal warfare that can happen between dev, test, and ops. So here's our friendly developer who checks code into the repo, right? They high five each other in the parking lot saying we made the date, right? Not realizing that they've set the entire data center on fire and the rest of us have to fix it, you know, for the entire weekend. And so when this happens, no one's achieving their goals. Features are starting to take longer to get to market. Deployments are taking longer. We have an ever increasing number of seven outages in production and test and operations, everyone downstream of development starts becoming buried in unplanned work, robbing us of our ability to actually pay down technical debt and fix the non-functional requirements. Uh, does anyone here have a friend that can resonate with some elements of this story? Some? <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I think this is what leads to a sense of 
hopelessness and despair, right? Where we feel like we're trapped in a system that preordains failure, where we are powerless to change the outcomes. And what I've learned in my journey is that there's no more worst thing that we can do to a fellow human being than to put them into a situation where we can't control the outcomes. So I think that damages uh, fellow human beings. And ultimately, it also ensures that we fail the organizations that we serve. So the, the good news, as if, uh, if there is good news, is that I think we now understand better than ever why the symptomology occurs. Why does this downward spiral happen? And I think I'm going to share with you two statistics, I think evidence why this happens, and then we'll talk about the countermeasures. So this, I love this quote, it says in any, t part of it might be a side effect of how we're organized inside of technology, uh, inside of IT. You know, we have two simultaneous business needs that are valid and must be served. We have to respond quickly to urgent business needs, and that often manifests itself in this desire to ship features ever more quickly, and that's what the head of development might say. But we also need to provide reliable, stable service to the customer, and that often manifests itself in this desire to make no changes ever. Over my dead body is what the head of operations might say. And what I've learned in my journey is that that can quickly be arranged, right? Because time to market will always trump availability, security, performance, and certainly paying down technical debt. So I think that's maybe a fact of life, but we know that there might be a better way. The second is, why does it happen in almost every organization? Why isn't it not just the Googles and Amazons of the world? And I think is that every company is an IT company, regardless of what business that we actually think we're in. And I think these numbers show why. 95% of all capital projects have a technology component, and 50% of all capital spending is technology related. So for any business leader to say, we're not Google, we're not Amazon, you know, uh, you know Technology is not a core competency, I think is a height of management self-delusion. I think here is the best visceral proof point I would offer you, is if you ask anybody in the organization outside of IT, you know, if here's where we are and here's where we need to be, who's in the way? Who is conspiring to make sure that every goal, dream, aspiration isn't met? <laughs> who's constipating the flow of work to make sure that everything that we want to do can't be done? And the answer in general is, is those IT people. Right? And in fact, if we were to drill into that IT box, and if we uh, have a configuration where we have multiple development groups feeding into a centralized IT operations group that's operating as a shared service, the constraint in the bottleneck is IT operations. And I can speak from first-hand experience, that's a very uncomfortable and vulnerable place to be. So there must be a better way. And this is why I'm so excited about DevOps, is that we now see that it is possible to break this core chronic conflict. Apparently, it is possible to do, have fast flow of changes and deployments into the production environment while preserving world-class reliability, stability, and availability and performance. And why do we know this? It's because the unicorns have shown us that this to be true. So these are organizations uh, that are routinely you know, doing this as a part of their daily work. So one, I, I genuinely believe 10 years from now, historians, historians will look back around this time and say, that this, something significant happened. This was a time of incredible transformation of how we work with technology. And I think Agile will be a part of that story. You know, cloud will certainly be a part of that story. But I think the dominant part of the narrative will be DevOps. And so when they ask where did DevOps come from, I think they're going to point to this presentation that was given at the Velocity Conference in 2009. So the Velocity Conference is where the unicorns hang out. They show off the toughest dev and ops problems and how do they fix it. And by all first-hand accounts, when people saw the John Oswald, Paul Hammond presentation, they knew they were in the presence of something historically significant. They were, uh, so who are Oswald and Hammond? John Oswald was the VP of operations at Flickr. Paul Hammond was the director of engineering at Yahoo. And they said they were doing 10 deploys a day as a part of, every day as a part of their daily work. So I have to uh, admit that I, when I first heard this presentation, my reaction was not, this is historically significant. My reaction was this. 10 deploys a day, that's impossible. They're lying, and if they're not lying, it's surely irresponsible, reckless, ill-advised, and mostly, most likely immoral, right? Because what sort of decent human being would do 10 deploys a day to someone else? It's just not nice. And yet I now believe, uh, whether we're in dev, test, ops, performance engineering, product owner, security, if we cannot create a system of work around us where we can do 10 deploys a day, or at least deployments on demand, then we risk irrelevance, and that actually causes our organization that we serve uh, to be at the risk of irrelevance. So let me share with you what the highlights of the Oswald Hammond presentation are before we go into the, into the how. What I love so much about the Oswald Hammond presentation is how brilliantly they depicted the 
that dev and ops are often uh, the, at diametric poles. You know, Spock is like the embodiment of development. He gets to sit on the bridge with Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk actually asks him for advice, listens, uh, factors it into the strategic plan. Um, whereas Scotty, and he has the positional power and the budgetary power you know, to reflect that. Whereas Scotty doesn't get to sit on the bridge. Scotty's stuck in the basement. He never gets invited to meetings. The only meetings he gets invited to are the several outage calls. And if I were Scotty, you know, I would say, hey, you've deferred planned maintenance for five years. You fix it. <laughs> Not my problem. And yet Scotty does save the day, but he never gets to sit on the bridge and have the budgetary positional power that Dev does. And by the way, coming from information security, who are we? You know, we're like these guys. Right? You, know, you have a repeat audit finding? I know what the problem is as a security people. What appealed to me so much about the DevOps community, it is one fundamentally of boundary spanning. They say we need ops people who can think like developers and developers who can think like ops people. And the result is not just this tour, it's summer of love, but the result is that they're getting business outcomes that we didn't even think possible five years ago. So if there's one thing that I would want you to know as you are trying to mobilize and create the coalition of the willing to put these sort of practices into place is that there are people you know, in the DevOps community who are waiting for you with open arms. And to prove this to you, I want to share with you a, a couple slides from Theo Schlossnagel. And what he said is, you know, he loves DevOps, but he thinks it's a crappy term, it's incomplete, it's prone to misinterpretation. What would he call it? He would call it star ops. Or maybe more pedantically, dot star ops. Right? Or maybe more pedantically, every department ops. Because he's asking, Where's network engineering? Where are the DBAs? Where's performance engineering? Where are the product owners? Because essentially these are all the people in the village that we need to mobilize to make sure that we can actually have a safe flow of planned work while preserving the ability to, to provide reliable service. So one of the uh, most exciting things for me over the last 10 years was working with the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And I learned many things from them, but one of the things I think about all the time is this one phrase that they taught me. High performers in every field accelerate away from the herd. And that is absolutely happening in the DevOps space. So we used to think in 2009, 10 deploys a day was fast. These days it's considered mediocre. Uh, John Jenkins at Amazon went on record last year saying they're not doing 10 deploys a day. They are doing one deployment every 11.6 seconds. So that's a mean number of deployments of 23,000 per day. So what is a deployment? It could be code being put into the production environment in a disabled state. It could be a feature release behind an AB feature toggle or an AB test. It could be a configuration change in the environment. It could be a database schema change, God forbid. Uh, it could be you know, 10,000 new environments going online, all considered one deploy. And why is this so important? is because it shows us that we can make changes when our organizations need it most. And for me, what the biggest aha moment came in this quote here from Scott Cook, the founder of Intuit. He said, for their TurboTax property, they did 165 production changes, production experiments, during peak tax filing season. So when I first read this quote, I have to admit, my first reaction was this. These guys are idiots. These guys have no idea what they're doing, right? Because the way I was trained, especially in retailing, right, we were so afraid of the holiday outage, we had a change freeze from October 1 to January 30th, right? So why would these knuckleheads right, make changes when it matters the most? And I think the answer is revealed in the second paragraph. By doing those production experiments, we were able to increase the conversion of the website by 50%. So here's my three aha moments. One is it takes phenomenal dev and ops skill, performance engineering skills, collab in collaboration to be able to pull this off. Two is that perhaps the best time to do production experiments is during peak traffic seasons. Right? In other words, had they waited until April 16th when the US tax filing season is over, they could have lost their customers and their prospects to the competition never again to return. And the third is that there's an increasing body of thought that says in order to win in the marketplace, we have to out-experiment the competition. In other words, not all good ideas are great ideas. Not all ideas are good ideas. Maybe one out of 10 are actually exothermic. The question is, which one is it? And by the way, I loved uh, Gopal's story yesterday from Nordstrom. You know, the, uh, the dressing room app actually reduced conversion rates and reduced order sizes. <laughs> so, so it's good to, uh, so the question is, where do you invest more effort into? And so without this capability to help experiment, you know, uh, our organizations will lose in the marketplace. And I think this explains why organizations are adopting DevOps. It's not just the unicorns, it's not our, just our technology providers, it's financial services, it's retailing, it's manufacturing, it's even higher education and government agencies like the US Department of Homeland Security. And the question is, why would these organizations adopt DevOps, something as radical as DevOps, when they often have a reputation of being very conservative? I think the answer is, is that the business value of adopting DevOps is even larger than we thought. 
So uh, I worked with a gentleman named Jez Humble. Uh, he wrote the book, Continuous Delivery. Uh, and over the last two years, we have benchmarked 14,000 organizations trying to establish what does high performance look like and what are the behaviors, the technical practices, and the cultural norms that predict performance. So what we found was that high performers do exist, and they are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers. They're doing 30 times more frequent deployments. That's code deployments and environment deployments. And they can complete them 8,000 times faster. In other words, how quickly can they go from code committed by development through the test cycle, through the deployment cycle, running in production? High performance can do it in minutes, maybe hours. Lower performers take months. Right, so lower performers take months. High performers can do it in minutes. So not only are they pushing more code into the production environment, but they're also getting far better outcomes. When they do a production deployment of code or environments, they're twice as likely to succeed without causing a service impairment, service down, security breach, compliance failure. And when something does go wrong, because Murphy does exist, they can fix it 12 times faster. So the mean time to spare service, restore service is 12 times faster. So in our minds, this is so important because it showed that we can actually be more agile and be more reliable at the same time. In fact, if you want reliability profiles like this, short mean time to pair, you, we have to do, be doing smaller deployments more frequently. So that was a key finding over the last two years. But this year, we found an even more shocking finding is that high performers, not only do they have greater best IT performance, they have better organizational performance. High performers were twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And if, for those 1,300 organizations that gave a stock ticker symbol, the high performers had 50% higher market cap growth than the lo lower performers. <laughs> so apparently, DevOps does matter, and it helps organizations win at the, at the expense of those who are not. Uh, let me just share with you one more case study before we go into the principles and patterns. One of the case studies I was so excited uh, to study with Jez Humble was this. Uh, this came from Darren Haig. He's the operations architect at SAP inside the IT operations group. So their remit is to deliver SAP service internally, both for SAP and SAP customers. And he described at Java 1 how they, by adopting DevOps principles, they were able to reduce the lead time from code committed to running in production from 6 to 12 months to a week. So I would submit to you, if you can do it for SAP, you can do it for anything, right? Because I cannot think of any software package that is more cumbersome and more designed to be not agile than SAP. And if you can think of one, please tell me about it, because you know, I love those. So uh, my favorite book over the last 15 years was a book called The Goal. It was written by Dr. Eliyahu Goldratt. Uh, it was a novel about a plant manager who had to fix his cost and due date issues in, in uh, th 90 days, otherwise it would shut the plant down. And there was no doubt in my mind that the lessons being imparted in that book were relevant to the work that we do every day. And so for 10 years, we wanted to write the goal, but for the IT context. And that's what the Phoenix Project is. And so there are many, many similarities between the goal and the Phoenix Project. And you know, trust me, that's not by accident. We studied that book for 10 years, getting ready to write the book. Um, but one of them is that they both have a Mr. Miyagi Yoda-like character who speaks in very cryptic ways. Um, and so our Yoda speaks in the language of the three ways, which are intended to be the set of principles from which you can derive all the observed DevOps patterns from. And so what I want to do in the remainder of the presentation is just share with you what those principles are and as, you know, some of my favorite patterns that can be derived from them. So the first way is all about flow as we go from left to right in the value stream. And by the way, that's from dev to ops. Why dev and ops? Because dev and ops are typically what's in between the organization and the customers that we serve. And the goal is to you know, maximize flow. So in the DevOps community, our favorite metric, without a doubt, is probably deploys per day. Flickr did 10, Amazon does 23,000. Uh, but in the manufacturing world, the most cherished metric is not deploys per day, it's lead time. In other words, how quickly can we go from raw materials at one end of the plant to finished goods at the other? And there's a deeply held belief in the lean community that lead time is the most accurate predictor of quality, customer satisfaction, and employee happiness. And what we found in our benchmarking is that that's apparently true in the DevOps space as well. And so, you know, I think in the grand, in the biggest value stream, you know, lead time in our work is probably when engineering accepts, uh, dev accepts work uh, to be implemented to when it's actually running in production. But for the vast majority of organizations, I think we can actually focus on a subset of that, which is how quickly can we go from code committed in the source code repo to code uh, tested, code deployed, and successfully running in production. And that is a phenomenal predictor of almost all IT performance. It's also a great predictor of this. How much do the dev and ops people hate each other? The longer the lead time, you know, the more distrust there is between dev and ops. 
And it, apparently, the longer the lead time, the more is highly correlated with these catastrophic deployment outcomes. So if, I were to, if we were to sort of think back at the most catastrophic deployment errors made over the last 20 years, Toys R Us 1999, Amazon 2001, um, you know, LinkedIn 2008, um, you know, maybe healthcare.gov, right? Regardless of your politics, right? When these things happen, they're typically high, you know, very correlated with very long lead times. Because when what happens? The first time when the code was being run in a production-like environment was during the deployment. <laughs> so how many, does that resonate with you guys? Yeah. So when that happens, right, all sorts of bad things happen. So the countermeasure is how do we make production-like environments available in the earliest parts of the development process? And this is something that all high performers do. Anyone who wants a production-like environment can get one. They don't have to open up a ticket. They don't have to wait 42 weeks. They can get one on demand. Uh, where do they come from? They come from a common build mechanism that can build the dev, test, and prod environments all at the same time, thus eliminating a whole category of synchronization errors that happen uh, during code migration. And so, by the way, I used to think that developers hated testing their code. I mean, and I, I realize that's a little bit ungenerous, but why would I believe that? If you've seen some of the things I've seen deployed in production, that's, that's the only explanation I could come up with, right? Is that obviously they didn't like testing the code. Uh, but now I you know, actually believe developers do t like testing the code. We just need to make one policy change if we can make an, uh, environments available on demand. I love this uh, thing that comes from the Scrum Toolkit, right? We want small deployment intervals. And at the end of each deployment interval, we have working and potentially shippable code. But we need to add one more clause to that. If I could wave a magic wand, I would love this to make it back to the Scrum Toolkit. At the end of each sprint, we have to have working and shippable code demonstrated in a production-like environment. And the reason why this is so awesome and the reason why it causes such dramatically better outcomes is that by the time at the end of the first sprint, we'll have actually not only integrated the feature branches all into trunk instead of waiting to the end of the project, but we'll also have integrated the code in a production-like environment. It means by the end of the project, we'll have done this hundreds or maybe even thousands of times, right? thus eliminating a whole category of deployment errors that happen all too often. So one of the, my favorite phrases is, you know, uh, you're only as smart as the average of the top five people you hang out with. Right? Uh, my, correlate, my unfortunate observation is that when you hang out with smart people, you feel dumb all the time. And you know, I want to share with you two times I felt very, very dumb. One of them was when Jez Humble explained to me how Facebook chat was probably one of the best examples of continuous integration and continuous delivery um, ever. And so well, I guess um, the reason why I dismissed it was that it was a chat server. You know, I had written one of those as an undergraduate, not so hard. But apparently with 98 million users, pretty hard. Order n cubed you know, uh, if you, is the most straightforward implementation. It was the largest technical team that Facebook had assembled. It took one year for them to develop. How did they use that year? Every, almost every day for that year, uh, project year, they were checking code, developers were checking code daily. Everything that was in trunk got promoted to production. Um, and for the vast majority of that year, they were using every Facebook browser session as a test harness. They were sending invisible chat messages to you know, the uh, invisible chat services that were uh, still latent in the production environment. And so when it came time to release the code uh, to, to uh, the functionality, they went from zero users to 70 million users overnight without a hitch. How? They were testing in production under production-like loads for almost a year. So that's amazing. So what are the technical practices of that? And by the way, I used to think testing in production was morally wrong. That's what bad developers did, and yet I think it's such a game changer because it unlocks a whole set of capabilities that were not possible five years ago or were very rare. So we're decoupling the feature release from the code deployment. In other words, in my mind, the best mental metaphor is Operation Desert Shield. We, it was a nine-month-long project where we staged thousands, hundreds of thousands of men and materials into a staging environment every day. Uh, but there was one marketing release event that indicate that was, began Operation Desert Storm. So we, as dev, test, ops, as performance engineers, we are, must be responsible for making sure that we can seamlessly move code into the production environment without causing chaos and disruption. And we can now hold marketing responsible for, was the feature worth our time? Did it achieve the desired business result? And by conflating those two, all sorts of terrible things happen. This requires that we be able to put code in production hidden from the customer. Um, it requires that we integrate code and de deploy into trunk um, every day instead of waiting at the end of the project. And it means that it frees ourselves from this learned behavior that deployments hurt. So no longer do operations people and us have to do deployments at midnight on Friday and work all weekend to get it running. Right? Instead, we can do them in the course of our normal daily work 
And suddenly operation, maybe the first time in decades, can actually work normal hours just like everybody else. Uh, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. So you might be thinking, that's great for Facebook, but we're dealing with legacy applications, right? That can't be applicable to us, right? I want to share with you one graph that really made a huge impact on me. This comes from Scott Pru. From, uh, he's the chief architect at CSG. They're the largest bill printing company in the United States. If you get a paper bill from a cell phone carrier or a cable company, chances are it comes from a CSG plant. And he, they did an experiment for the COBOL mainframe app and the surrounding 20 technology platforms. They moved the deployment cadence from once every 20 weeks to once every 14 weeks. They have the deployment interval. What was the result? Incident count went down by 60%. Mean time to repair went down by 80%. And the settling time went down from 14 days to one day. In other words, how long did it take for the operations to be able to run the app to run in production in a hands-off state? 14 days to one day. I was like, Scott, that's amazing, right? That, yeah, that's uh, the best evidence I've ever seen. And he said, Gene, you actually sort of missed a point. The real value is that the customer got the value in half the time. Right? So it's great for dev test and ops, but it's also great for the organization that we serve as well. Let me paint for you one last element why I think this is such a game changer for the work that we do. Nathan Schimmick, he's an engineering at New Context, they're a consulting firm. He told me this a couple weeks ago, and I actually teared up when I heard this. He said, as a lifelong apps practitioner, I know that we need DevOps to make our work more humane. In the past, in my career, I've worked every holiday, on my birthday, on my spouse's birthday, and even on the day my son was born. <laughs> right? uh, so for anyone who's leading a technology function, right, I don't think we want to be leading a system that creates these kind of working conditions. So I think this is important, and it changes lives. So we need to version control our production artifacts, with ideally a single repo that all of dev and ops share. We need to create determinism in the release process. We have consistent dev, test, and production environments all synchronized long before the big deployment. We're freeing ourselves from this learned behavior that deployments hurt. Instead, we're doing them every day, multiple times a day. And developers, when there are problems, developers can actually reproduce problems. This is what shrinks lead time. This is how we go from months to get into production down to weeks, down to days, to ideally on demand and hours. And that's by doing that, that's how we increase our deployment cadence. So that's the first way, is we go from left to right in the value stream. The second way is all about the reciprocal, the flow of feedback from right to left. In other words, when something goes wrong in production, how do we make sure that we can ideally prevent that bad thing from happening again? And if we can't prevent it, how do we at least enable faster detection and recovery? And the the heart, I think the heart of the second way is really at the heart of almost any process move improvement methodology, this desire to shorten and amplify feedback loops. And the best, the paragon of this practice, of this principle, is bar none, the, the Toyota and Uncord. I spent a week at the University of Michigan getting trained on the Toyota production process, and I was actually stunned to find out plants modeled after the Toyota, Toyota production process is really is true. They have this cord on top of every work center. When everyone is trained, whether you're a regional vice president, plant manager, work center supervisor, wherever you are on the plant floor, if something goes wrong, we pull the cord. If the parts, aren't, or if the parts are defective, we pull the cord. If the parts aren't there, pull the cord. If the work takes longer than documented, pull the cord. If it takes a minute 20 seconds versus 50 seconds, we pull the cord. What happens when we pull the cord? The entire assembly line stops. Can anyone speculate in a given, in an average Toyota plant, in an average day, how many times is the andon cord pulled? Order of magnitude? Yeah, 3,500, okay, so 3,500 times a day. And you can imagine the first time I heard this statistic, my reaction was, these guys are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing, right? Don't they know every time you pull the cord, it stops the entire assembly line? So what's astonishing is that when you ask someone in a Toyota plant, why do you pull the andon cord so frequently, when it causes such massive global disruption, and the answer is universally something like this. It's the only way that we can sustain a build tempo of 2,000 vehicles per day. That's one every 55 seconds. Um, so essentially what they are verbalizing is that if you don't stop the flow of work, what will happen is that technical debt will accrue downstream where it becomes far more expensive or maybe even impossible to fix. What's astonishing about this figure is this is about 10 years old. In the same Toyota plants with the same uh, square footage, same capital equipment, same workforce, they're now not building 2,000 vehicles per day, they're building 4,000 vehicles per day. So it just shows that the best are getting better. So who is equivalent to Toyota in the DevOps space? In my mind, it's, it's Google. They have 15,000 
DevOps people working on 4,000 simultaneous projects. All, all, everything is checked into one source code repo. They do 5,500 code commits per day. They are running 75 million test cases daily. It doesn't hurt that they have more servers than God does, but the real question is why? Why would they bother even writing 75 million tests, let alone running 75 million test cases? cases. And I, the answer, I think, is revealed in this phrase from Aaron Massari. He's part of the SCM group there, the Dev Productivity Group. He said, it is only through automated testing that we can transform fear into boredom. He said, imagine the paralyzing fear that any new dev or ops person has at Google, knowing that every time you commit code, there's a small chance that you can take down every Google property all at the same time. <laughs> he said, the only way you can get people productive is to show them there is a safety net underneath them that will catch errors long before it gets into production. In fact, one of the hallmarks of DevOps organizations is that engineers, whether they were dev or ops, do deploys within their first week. At Etsy, the $1 billion a year um, eBay-like small craft company, their do engineers are required to do a deploy on their first day, dev or ops, because we have such a safe system of work they can get productive very quickly. What's another pattern? Developers carry pagers. I love this quote from Patrick uh, Lightbody. He uh, said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever. It's not because Patrick hated developers. He wasn't waking up random developers at random times. I think what he put his finger on was that in order to have genuinely shared goals between the dev test and ops value stream, we have to have some element of shared pain. Werner Vogels at Amazon says it even more succinctly. He says, if you help build it, you must help run it. And I think this is what we find in the, in the DevOps community as well. So I think uh, it's difficult to overstate how much angst there might be in the ops community around DevOps because you know, there's a fear that DevOps will automate everyone's jobs away. And I think in the development community, there's a similar backlash building, which is if you see a DevOps person coming down the hallway, run the other way. Or better yet, see if you can sabotage the project because we did not become developers to wear a pager. That is for the ops people. But I would submit to you that there is an, another alternative narrative that's actually far more satisfying. This comes from Tim Tischler. He's the director of ops engineering at Nike. And he said, as a career-long developer, there's never been a more satisfying point in my career than when I got to write the code, push the code into production myself, see the happy, smiling faces when it worked, see their angry, shaking fists when it didn't work, and I could fix it myself. I didn't have to open up a ticket, wait a half a day for someone else to fix it when I could have done it better myself. And I think when we can't do that, that really removes so much of the joy, serenity, and flow that we get when we develop things. And that's been removed from our work over the last 10 years. And I think DevOps is what brings it back. One of the other things that we see in high performers is this notion of pervasive production telemetry, of which I think APM is a huge part of. This is John Allspaugh from the famous Allspaugh Hammond presentation. And I don't show it to show his face. I'm showing it because of what's behind him. But you know, he has gone on record saying that they are generating every day metrics around 250,000 production metrics, either at the feature level, application health, storage, networking, virtualization, everything. And there's this culture that spans DevOps that says, if we write something, whether it's in the code or in the environment, we must generate production telemetry for it so that we can actually see how it's doing in production. And for a developer, it shouldn't have to feel like doing a database schema change. We have to make it so easy so that if we implement a feature, we can develop the telem telemetry for. And so they have spent years investing in this thing called StatsD and Graphite, right? It's, you know, so that you can write one line of code and get your 250,000th and first metric. And what I think is so lovely about this is that, you know, in this case, it's number of logins, successful versus unsuccessful, overlaid onto it are the deploys. So no developer in a DevOps organization will do a deploy and then go home. They will all look at these metrics to make sure that they haven't flatlined their metric before it, declaring it complete. Or you know, worse, they flatlined everyone else's metric <laughs> and then went home. You know, you know, they do whatever it takes to make sure it's actually operating in, as designed. And this is what we see in every high-performing DevOps organization. So this is, um, this is Rally Software, another publicly traded um, agile planning tool. You see the same sort of cultural artifact. And, and, uh, we saw the same thing in uh, the Nordstrom presentation yesterday. And you know, right before I had whispered into uh, this is True and Ready. He's the director of ops. And by the way, he's now the VP of ops uh, as of two weeks ago. I had, uh, right before I took the picture, someone whispered into his ear, Chirun, uh, the dilithium crystals are fluctuating. We're down 30%. Uh, I think we have a problem. 
And you know, what was interesting was that everyone was looking at the telemetry, trying to figure out, was it a database issue or was it a storage issue? And you know, I actually asked them a question later that I think genuinely offended them. You know, I asked them, are we actually watching a SEV1 outage in progress? Are our customers actually down? And their, their reaction was this, no. <laughs> no. We just found a variance that we just don't understand, and we want to find a variance, uh, we want to understand it before it causes an even bigger variance. By the way, one thing about uh, what's interesting about these guys is they actually, in their operations group, they have a statistician on staff who can write R code. So on their backlog are a whole bunch of scripts that, were, that people want written to find variants ever earlier, um, you know, before the customer is impacted. All right. So this whole notion of shifting left, right? Uh, you know, performance engineering is everybody's job. We want to find performance problems early. We want to enable dev, if possible, to deploy into production environment, and we want to enable dev to recreate production errors and tests. What a game changer. Let me share with you one episode that I probably felt the dumbest. I was on the phone with Jez Humble and John Allspaugh, and over a course of 90 minutes, they convinced me that almost everything that I held dear in terms of core beliefs may be wrong. In other words, the, what I thought was the right thing to do may actually preordain the future likelihood of bad things happening again. So what we were talking about was the Knight Capital failure. So for, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is the deployment error that caused a $440 million trading loss. John Oswald calls this the Knight Capital accident. And what they convinced me was is that the typical low trust command and control countermeasures that we would put, typically put into place as a result of something like the Knight Capital accident will preordain, preordain the outcome of it happening again more frequently and it being worse. So what I want to do is share with you how they convinced me of that in 90 minutes, which led me to a, a six-week period of which I can only characterize as existential despair. Here's, how, here's, the, here's the argument. There are two leading narratives of why the night capital accident occurred. The first is it was due to a change control failure, which is, I think, valid. In other words, maybe it was better change control processes. We could have spotted the risk earlier, prevented it from going into production. And if we couldn't have prevented it, maybe we could have established better readiness so we could detect and correct for it faster. And I think that is hard to refute. I think that's valid. The second narrative is that the night capital accident happened because of a testing failure. And I think that's also difficult to argue. With better testing, we could have found the error, we could have fixed it, prevented it from happening. And if we, maybe if we couldn't have fixed it, we could have actually you know, put some bi problem bypass procedures so that we could qu enable quicker detection and recovery. The problem is this. The typical low trust countermeasures we put into place due to a change control failure or a testing failure make the problem worse. What is the typical change control countermeasure after something like this, we have one more field in the change request form, and we have one more level of signing authority required to actually approve the change before it goes into production. Does that resonate with you? How many people can resonate that have heard that? Yeah. So what they convinced me of was that that will reduce, that will actually reduce the quality of the outcomes. Why? Because the fur we know through a century of research, the further the distance between the person deciding to do the work and the person doing the work, the worse the outcomes, right? In other words, the best person to actually make that decision is actually the person doing the work. So my reaction is like, uh-oh. <laughs> but it's not as bad as the second one. What is the typical countermeasure we put into place when there's a testing failure? It's obvious, right? We do more testing. The problem is, is that if there's any amount of manual testing, it means that to do more testing, we have to deploy it less frequently. And when I show, you remember the CSG graph I showed you? The longer the interval between deployments, change success rates go down, and the mean time to repair goes up. <laughs> My reaction is like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, did you see what I, can, can you resonate with why I found that so disturbing? <laughs> is that the typical management response makes the problem get worse. What's the right countermeasure? We have to do deployments more frequently. We have to create a safe system of work that allows and we have to, that fully empowers the person who's actually doing the, the deployment to decide how to do it, when to do it, and under what conditions to do it. And in fact, this was one of the top predictors of performance. The number three predictor of IT performance and organizational performance was whether the organization was low trust or high trust. Low trust looks like this. How or, organizations would say, we shoot messengers who tell bad news, 
We shirk responsibilities. We discourage bridging between functions. We cover up failures. Why? Because messengers of bad news are shot. And new ideas are crushed. High trust looks like this. We train messengers to tell bad news because performance engineering, operations, stability, that's everybody's job. That requires bridging between functions. And when bad things happen, it causes a sense of genuine inquiry. Um, and we, in order to fix it, we are open to any new novel idea, regardless of how crazy it sounds. Why? Because if the problem were easy to fix, we would have fixed it already. So what's astonishing to me is that how organizations answer this question, but this is the way, this is called the Westrom typology model. Dr. Westrom built this to show that in healthcare organizations, patient safety was highly correlated with this. It's true in healthcare, and apparently it's true in DevOps as well. And I think this, how we transform from low trust to high trust is probably the grandest management challenge of our decade. And maybe I'll give you a concrete evidence point. If we go back to the Knight Capital accident, I think if we were to propose this, I think here's how management management would hear it. Let me get this right. You have screwed us before in the past, and now you want to do it more frequently with less supervision. That is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I never want to hear it again. Meeting is at an end, right? And yet, how we transform from low trust to high trust, I think, is going to be one of the most important things that we need to develop as leaders over the next five years. So uh, the outcomes. We have defects and security issues getting fixed faster than ever. We have discipline testing that happens everywhere that we can roll out not just for one application, but we can roll out to every application in our uh, portfolio. All groups are communicating and coordinating better. But more importantly, everyone's getting more work done. So the first way is all about flow as we go from left to right in the value stream. The second way is about the flow of feedback from right to left. And the third way is about how do we create this culture of experimentation and learning where it's safe to make mistakes and that's a part of everybody's job. And I think the best embodiment of this philosophy comes from Adrian Cockcroft. He's probably uh, most famous uh, these days for his work at Netflix as a cloud architect. And he said, our goal is to do painful things more frequently, breaking all of human nature. And even though we make life hell for developers sometimes, the response that we get back from them is, thank you so much. Because we know that doing this will make future rollouts go more smoothly. I think the best evidence of the effectiveness of this philosophy and practice is, without a doubt, the first EC2 outage that happened in 2011. Uh, you know, if you were on EC2, if you had friends who were on EC2, you'll remember this because you went down, right? Everybody using EC2 went down all at the same time, except for one organization, Netflix. And so for weeks, everybody was asking, what is Netflix doing differently that caused such a different outcome for them? The leading theory was, well, obviously, Netflix is Amazon's biggest customer. They must have a secret API that, <laughs> that allowed them to stay up. Um, the real answer was revealed um, some weeks later in a seminal blog post where they essentially revealed two engineering design decisions. One, we could never depend upon Amazon for availability. They will never be there when we need them most. Two, is in order to survive failure, we had to fail all the time. And that's where they unveiled what the now famous chaos monkey, right? This incredibly audacious piece of code that runs on every production server and it randomly kills servers, it randomly kills processes in production all the time. And so you can imagine after they deployed chaos monkey, you know, they quickly got more resilient code, more resilient environments and a more resilient organization. There's two things that uh, Adrian Cockcroft doesn't talk about, but you should know. One is before you deploy chaos monkey in production, run it first in test which they do. <laughs> Two is, did you know that, uh, that Netflix went six hours into the EC2 outage before declaring a 7-1 incident? Each hour they would visit it and say, should we declare a 7-1 incident? Nah, it will probably come back. It was only six hours into the outage that they said, maybe it's not coming back. <laughs> maybe we should at least activate some business continuity procedures just in case if it doesn't. And the reason why I want to share that with you is that in the face of such utter chaos and disruption, right? Netflix was a sea of calm. It happened again uh, during the huge Zen reboot, right? Uh, 232 Cassandra nodes went down, no outage. Last technical practice I want to leave with you. Allocate 20% of all dev and ops cycles for the reduction of technical debt. Marty Kagan, he's a hero in the product management space. He says, that 20%, that's not for you to use. That's for the dev and ops people to use however they see fit to fix problematic areas in the code, problematic in in areas in the environment that allows us to refactor, implement better testing procedures, fix deployment processes. You know, 
And where he learned that lesson was when he was the VP of product man management at eBay. And he said, imagine how it feels when you're spending 100% of your time paying down technical debt. I haven't shipped a new feature in two years, right? So if you don't pay your 20% tax, you are destined to spend 100% paying down technical debt. So by doing that, you know, that's how we go from a situation that looks like this, that inevitably turns into a situation that looks like this. You know, if you can create that coalition of the willing, you know, with a collective will to make it so, you know, that's how we can actually go from here to a situation that looks like this. Right? This is the dot-com infrastructure at uh, VeriSign, arguably one of the single points of failure for a good chunk of the internet. This is an $80,000 cabling job. Didn't even blink an eye because they know that this is what it takes to run world-class service. So why do I think this is important? This downward spiral left unchecked results in this. Hopelessness and despair, and ultimately the organization that we serve losing in the marketplace. A fellow co-author and I, we did a little calculation where we asked how much business values are on the table for us to recapture if we could just have the amount of IT waste in the value stream and redeploy in a way where we can get five times the value back. The number we came up with was $2.6 trillion per year. That's more than the entire GDP of France. So here's the way I think about that number. I have a six-year-old, two identical twin four-year-olds. You put $2.6 trillion into the economy over 20 years, we make a material difference in the levels of you know, standards of living, productivity, health, wealth, and prosperity. And we do things like that. You know, this is when suddenly a whole bunch of things become possible. Climate change, world peace, right? I genuinely believe that, and I think this is a problem that is within our control.